Dear colleagues, let me introduce my PhD topic, which is the use of autogenous tooth bone graft in our rich preservation. My name is Eleonora Shoyom, and I am from the Department of Periodontology. My mission is to change the mindset of the tooth extraction. I think none of the extraction sockets should be left, left unpreserved. Our aim is uh, to search for the best graft material and technique for overreach preservation. Mm -hmm. And to reach this aim, we have uh, two meta-analyses and uh, one of a uh, protocol of a randomized clinical trial. Let me introduce and uh, take some sites of the overreach preserva preservation. We know that every patient who comes to our clinic will lose at least one tooth during their lifetime. And without an immediate intervention, in the first year, the width of the overreach can be reduced by 50%. And this deficiency of the facial bony anatomy is a critical causative factor for implant failures and also has a negative impact on aesthetic implant complications. But without an immediate surgical intervention with overreach preservation, we can reduce these horizontal bone changes by 60 to 40%. So we have three projects. In the first project, we are investigating a novel bone graft material. In the second one is the comparison between of novel ARP techniques. And the third one is a comparison of different graft materials. So the first topic is the safety and efficacy of autogenous tooth bone grafts for our rich preservation. Our aim is to investigate whether autogenous tooth bone graft can be just as reliable for our rich preservation as the other bone graft materials. What we know about the other bone graft materials, they can be the particulate bone graft materials, they can be xenografts, allografts, and synthetic graft materials. They are really easy to use. They are these box type materials, but they only have the osseoconductive properties and the newly formed bone proportion is, can change between a wide range from 30 to 45%. And what about this novel graft materials? It's called autogenous tooth bone graft. It has a really easy and rapid workflow. We just extract the tooth, we clean it, we grind it like we would grind the coffee beans, and then after a sterilization procedure, we can fill it back to the extraction socket. It not only has the also conductive but the also inductive effect and the newly formed bone proportion is, can be up to 56% according to our preliminary findings. And not, about, not at least the price. So these box type materials cost 100 euros and these ATB only cost 40 euros. So our question, is autogenous tooth bone graft an effective way for our ridge preservation? And the primary outcome is the changes in ridge width in millimeter, and the secondary outcomes are the histological outcomes. Our hypothesis is that ATB can be as effective as other bone graft materials in preserving the width of the our ridge, and it has a greater graft remodeling capacity compared to other particulate graft materials. We did the systematic search in four databases and after the selection process we have 18 eligible articles. So the first outcome is the pooled mean of ridge width changes in millimeters. We know if we have the lower ridge width change, then we have a wider ridge of course of our ridge and the more predictable and safer the implant placement. We have two subgroups according to the measurement methods. Labeled with red line, you can see measurement at the crestal level, and labeled with yellow line at the CBCT, you can see measurement at the crestal level plus one millimeter. But we have a high heterogeneity in the first subgroup. This is because of the different population that the authors used. In the Yoshi article, they used only patients with a four-volt bony defect, and we know that we, if we have a more bony volt, then we have a better blood supply and a better healing, and of course, the ridge width change is much more less. So the effect size is 0.95 millimeter and 0.46 millimeter, and without overreach preservation, it would be 2.6 to 4.5 millimeter. And with xenograft, we can say that this is the gold standard, the most widely used graph material. It would be almost two millimeter. So our first hypothesis seems to be true. The secondary outcome is the histological outcome, and it, it's not that easy as the primary outcome because there is a lots of companies with thousands of protocols, and it's not that easy to divide these graph materials into subgroups. 
But we have three main types of uh, autogenous tube tooth bone graft, the mineralized one, the partially demineralized one, and the demineralized dentin matrix. But the mechanical and biological differences between these graft materials is not quite clear. clear. So that's why you will see a huge heterogeneity because of these differences of the protocols. So let me show you how we are taking the histological samples. After the healing processes, which is usually between four to six months, we are making the flap elevation. We do the trephine drilling to take the core biopsy. And on the histological sample, we can see three types of tissues, the residual grafts, the newly formed bone, and the soft tissue or connective tissue. That's why we are have uh, three uh, types of histological outcomes in the, these outcomes fields. So the first one is the pooled mean of residual graph proportion. We know if the lower the residual graph proportion, then the higher the bone implant contact, and then the more predictable the implant placement, because these encapsulated residual grafts could jeopardize the bone implant contact. As you can see, the heterogeneity is really high in these two subgroups. And as I mentioned before, this is because of the demineralization process and also because of the different population that the authors used. So the effect size is 11.61% and with xenografts it would be 30%. Uh, so our second hypothesis that ATB has a greater graph remodeling capacity, it seems to be also true. The second one is the newly formed bone proportion. We know, and it's logical, that if the higher the newly formed bone proportion, then the higher the bone implant contact, of course, and then more predictable the implant placement. So the effect size is 40.23%, and with xenograft it would be 20%, so our second hypothesis it seems to be true. And the third one is the pooled mean of connective tissue proportion. We know if the lower the connective tissue proportion, then the higher the bone implant contact and the more predictable the implant placement. The effect size is 45% and with xenograft it would be 30%. It uh, seems a little bit higher, but it seems like it does not affect the implant placement and the implant uh, survival rate. So to summarize our findings, the use of autogenous tooth bone grafts can be a safe and predictable way for our rich preservation, but there is a huge heterogeneity in the preparation process, and we have a lack of information of its exact influence on the graft material and also on the healing processes. The used tooth material, because some of the articles used only the root part and the other articles used the root and the crown part, seems not affect the mentioned parameters. We suggest a more detailed inclusion criteria for the further RCTs and RCTs with different processing methods. For example, ARM1 should be the demerized one and ARM2 should be the undemerized dentin matrix. And of course, we suggest a de detailed randomization procedures and a press specified analysis plan. According to these findings, we started to write our article. The second one is clinical radiographical histological evaluation and blood flow analysis of hard and soft tissue changes following overall rich preservation. We plan to have three arms in this uh, RCT. The first one is the Sokatia group. When we extract the tooth and uh, we grab some soft tissue from the hard palate and suture it above the extraction socket, we won't use any xenograft or autogenous graft materials in this group. The second group is the extraction site development technique. When uh, we extract the tooth, uh, we have a, this big uh, bony deficiency. So we use a xenogranic membrane to reconstruct this uh, bony deficiency and fix it with titanium pins. And we grab some soft tissue from the hard palate and suture it above the extraction socket. And the third one is the XSD plus ATB plus socket seal group. When we extract the tooth, we clean it, we grind it, we sterilize it and fill it back to the extraction socket. And we also reconstruct with the xenogranic membrane the buccal bony deficiency and also we grab some soft tissue from the hard palate and suture it above the extraction socket. So our question, are these novel techniques a predictable way for our rich preservation? And there are hypotheses that XSD and XSD plus ATB groups are expected to have less pronounced horizontal weight losses and XSD group is expected to produce the highest graph turnover. And of course the clinical implication is to evaluate these novel techniques for ARP. 
So we already wrote the protocol and we are waiting for the ethical approval. So our aim is to search for the best graph material for overreach preservation and the best techniques. And I would like to thank you for your kindly attention with this good. Thank you. Really nice presentation. I just have one question about your first project, about your um, histological outcome. I would like to ask if there was a difference between the methods of the taking of the biopsy between the studies which can maybe lead to uh, the heterogeneity as well, or did you uh, have some data about that, about the depth of, depth of the biopsies taken or uh, something like this? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Uh, the depth of the biopsy is of course changing because it depends on the implant uh, um, um, parameters. So if the implant is longer, then of course the depth is going to be much more higher. But uh, there is no other findings. And of course it's very interesting because uh, when we extract the tooth, and fill it with the material. So at the zero point, we don't have anything in the extraction socket. And after the healing process, we have these uh, proportions and it's really objective. So it's, it's the best for to evaluate these uh, materials in the histological field. My question is, um, is there any evidence for a longer period of time follow-up? Because I have seen most of the articles you have investigated, your group have been investigated, are from uh, 2017, 18, and uh, even more from 21. Um, my, my question is, my interest, uh, uh, what, what is happening? So what happened to the to the uh, hydroxyapatite crystals uh, the researchers and clinicians uh, uh, used to, to fill up the extraction socket. Because as far as I remember, the, the problem was with the xenos, uh, they, they, they weren't really uh, integrated into the, the, the human body. So what happens to the, the drilled, milled uh, dentin? Is there any longer follow-up already in the literature? Thank you for your questions. Uh, first, in 1960s, they investigating the autogenous tooth bone grafts, but uh, only in 2018 is the first uh, data when they first used for human studies. And that's why we don't have this longer follow-up, unfortunately. But we are also very curious what will happen I thought so. <laughs> after, I, after I, a longer I, period of time. I know time. your supervisors, they are usually interested in this kind of question. And uh, <laughs> is there any evidence, uh, molecular biological uh, studies about the, the bone induction? I mean, where the, the bony cells are coming from? So what's their origin? Are there um, uh, mesenchymal stem cells or... Uh, which types of cells? Because uh, beyond the grafts, there, there is the, the platelet-rich fibrin techniques, so there are additional methods uh, giving very, you know, gorgeous data, at least compared to the xenografts. So... Yeah, thank you for your <coughs> question. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough in vitro studies. Uh, so we are at luck of them, and that's why we are suggesting in our systematic review to make some more data because uh, we don't have any of, of these data. I, I, actually, I, I have to tell you the <coughs> truth. Uh, the clinicians usually don't really interested in because they, they want bone to put in implants. <laughs> okay. okay, thank yeah. you. I, and the nice thing about this is that, that they do have, uh, they already have studies which actually they established this, and then they went to meta-analysis, and now they go to uh, clinical trials, so the full scale is happening. And this is actually what we would like to see in most of the projects. And this is what we hope to see in most of the projects, and actually this will flourish. So this is just the beginning of the, of, of the whole stuff. And, uh, and I really hope that this is happening. My only question, if, if we can still have, because that's for our own interest, if you go back to your uh, uh, subgrouping, um, at this one, okay. Uh, so if, if you look at this, that in the subgroups, I mean, they are quite diverse 
results. And uh, the one on the, on the middle, that actually, that consists your study, I think, and another one, and that's on the right, and then some other studies on the left. So this is, I mean, don't explain the details, but this happens actually to, in other meta-analyses too, that what, what do you think is the, the, the reason for the difference? Very, very good question, but I think in this low sample size, it's, uh, it's not uh, that professional to, to say something about this data, but the demiralization process is, uh, can affect this, because in the first group it's a fully demiralized dentin matrix, in the second group it's partially demiralized, and, um, in, and of course the third one is demineralized, and as we can see, these uh, uh, two subgroups, the partially and undemerized uh, subgroups, they are on the right side and the demerized is definitely on the left side. So maybe, but it's really just a maybe in this, this quite low sample size, can be the reason for this.